aware of what those numbers look like. I did put some projections in here as well, just uh, for information. But with the, those included, then we're looking at 357,000 overall. Um, so basically, aside from any major event or expense, um, um, planned event, I guess, or expense, uh, or if weather, any significant weather changes, um, we think we're, we'll be pretty close to that on target. So, and as always, the supervisors and department heads continue to be conscientious of their budgets, um, following up and ensuring that the work is getting done within their budgeted allocation. So I'll just move you to um, page 18. This is kind of a roll up of, of the tax support by department. Um, I'll just mention that the airport, um, we've left it in there because it was budgeted, but it's just anticipated to, to stay with the 50,000 tax support that the county already committed at the beginning of the year when budget was accepted. So overall, again, the $357,000 surplus, I can go, I'll go through these briefly and just sort of explain them, but even with that surplus, we're looking at just shy of 98% of the um, tax support utilized. So I think uh, that's pretty good considering our tax support is almost 15 million is what was approved. So council and CAO's office are looking at some some deficits. Um, portion for the council is related to uh, per diem travel expenses. And for the CAO, um, some of that is to the, the CAO recruitment or hiring of the new CAO as well as the um, outgoing interim CAO. So there's some costs there that were incurred. Under egg services, there's a bit of a surplus. A lot of this is due to um, the dry year that we had. Um, mowing was done, but it, you know, it was a dry year, so not as much as required as on average, as well as there was retirement um, through the years. So there's a little bit of um, gain, I suppose you could say, in wages and salaries there for the retirement. Um, in fleets, there was a projected surplus um, that I put in of about 70,000. Um, sorry, I'll just go to my notes here to tell you what that was. Um, most of this is just due to, although the fuel costs were a little bit higher for this year, he was able to make up for it a bit more in some of the contracted services that weren't required and small equipment um, purchases that weren't required. So that'll be a transfer to the fleet reserve for future um, equipment and vehicle purchasing. Public Works Department, we're looking at about a $200,000 um, surplus at this time. So this, um, Public Works is quite a large department, obviously. Their budget is um, 7.6 million plus for the whole budget. The roads activities um, is actually probably going to be slightly over budget. We put in some projections for snow removal, although since October we haven't had that much snow. Um, there's been a little bit, but we still have most of the month of December left. If there's any snow fall to occur over the Christmas break, um, there's overtime and extra hours attributed to that, as well as a grading budget. Um, we're able to that will be fully utilized. There'll be some additional costs there related to the um, flooding. So there's some costs that we can't get back through the disaster services, and some of it was just extra grading that was required and man hours. So there's some additional costs there. The savings that we're going to see basically are in the ACP and cold mix roads activity. Um, although patching and spot repair has been done and was contracted out, there's going to be some surplus there. Um, we also have in general work, so that would be um, this year as well. And any costs that we did have that we could charge back, we received a 10% um, admin, we charged a 10% sort of admin administration fee on top of what our um, outright costs are. So you can see a little bit of savings there. So most of the activities within this department will be utilized fully um, with just a few projected surpluses, as I mentioned. So about 200,000, which is still over 97% of the public works budget. Technical services. A big chunk of that is the venture uh, payment. Oh, right, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Another portion of that surplus is the venture payments. Just we based it, the budget on when we would draw on those venture payments and estimated um, when those draw dates and the payment dates would be made. So um, the later that the draw made, then we don't have to make a payment there, but for budget purposes, we estimated. Steve? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me. 
on the disaster recovery program, the 275,000, are we still not sure that we're getting that? They, you still have to submit? It's a, like I said, pending their review and that? So everything has been submitted to date. Um, there were some costs that they did identify that were ineligible. I think the 275 was sort of a base amount that they will they'll only pay us, of course, what they approve. So it, it's just in the review process right now. So we don't know 100% um, certain whether or not we'll receive those funds. But so anticipated though. Okay. Um, so just moving down to technical services, there's no other questions there. A uh, bit of a surplus in that department as well. And that's just mainly due to, um, well, we have some projected revenues that we didn't realize. Um, so there's a loss there, but then with, there is some um, gain in the expense side, which is some supply of the contracted services. Being that this is a new department, fairly new department, and uh, 2018 was our first full budget year with tech services. I don't think that's um, too much of a surplus, all things considered, when we were estimating a lot of the costs within that department for the year. Um, under the utilities department, it's showing here on page 18 um, as, even, as even, or basically no projected surplus or deficit, when there is a surplus of approximately 318,000 that we're projecting, which will be transferred to the utility capital uh, reserve for future capital infrastructure. A good portion of that is within the revenues. Um, some of that is offset with the cost of purchasing water, um, but not all of it because, of course, our rates are a bit higher than, than what our costs are there to offset the, the work that needs to be done in the distribution system. Um, being a dry year, we anticipated that these were going to be up again. So. And then uh, over budget, like I said, in the water distribution, and that's just due to the purchasing of the water. Um, the truck fill stations, a little bit of a surplus there, of course, again, being a dry year, more use there. And most of the surplus is made up within the um, garbage, fire ponds, and water, raw water. So um, fire pond maintenance that was required this year was minimal, so there weren't a lot of costs spent there. As well, I think there's, um, as the council's aware, there's some discussions of the, what we're doing at the, the fire ponds, the responsibilities, and how we're going to move forward with that. So the work there is, is pretty minimal, I think. Maintain it, make sure everything's in working order, rolling those kinds of things that need to be done. Uh, and again, in custom work, less work was required. Custom work was required of the utilities department this past year, so there's some surplus there. A lot of these things, when we were going through the budget process, we always kind of look at the trends, as, as mentioned in the budget deliberations. So the fire ponds was adjusted for within the budget and a few other areas of utilities. So, and we, only estimated or brought the revenues up, revenue rates, pardon me, up by the city portion because it's clear that we are at a cost recovery position right now. So, Jen, before you do that one, yep. uh, on page 12, you kind of briefly go into utilities a bit. Yep. So, is, are we now at the point in time where we don't, where we should begin looking at utilities as different as a regular department Just because we automatically are transferring this $318,000 reserves? But if we've made up to the point where we're self-recovering now, why, why are we continuing to do that? Um, that's just the surplus transfer. It, and it hasn't been done as of yet. That will be brought forward at year end, so it's a council decision. For the purport purposes, I, I showed it that way. Um, it appears that we are more or less at a cost recovery for operations for utilities with some gain in depending on whether in different situations within the budget. Um, I guess that will be a council decision what you want to do with, with utilities moving forward. I think in the 2019 budget, we we treated it the same way. We left it at cost recovery with just the debenture payment for the McCain water line um, as taxable, which they fund through the tax revenues that we receive from them. I don't know if that answered your question. Kind of. Rick? Yeah, so that's uh, it's cost recovery on annual expenses, but it's yeah, that doesn't cover any life cycle costing. So we, we had reported before that we're short on what we're putting into reserves and utilities to cover um, the, uh, the life cycle of, of our assets, especially the lagoons and the treatment uh, services. So we probably need to look at making a little clearer explanation of what we're doing it for then. 
because I think if you're looking at this from the public perspective, it'd be very difficult to follow that. Well, there, there's several assets that uh, have gone beyond. <coughs> Once we start investing in those assets, we're going to need money to be able to do that. I realize that, but we need to do a little better job of explaining it. And what I'm saying. And specifically, that is a the utility system is a is an item in our asset management plan which will tell us how much money we need to be investing annually into that system to keep it functioning. Um, I just meant if, if you'd like, when we bring forward the year-end surplus uh, deficit report, mm -hmm. there we can, we can speak to the utilities specifically and identify what their surpluses are prior to transfer as the council decides to do with those funds. Okay, my other question then is, uh, you talked about uh, attaching and spot repair of mostly contracted out, so we did not do it in-house. That was the uh, the crack filling, um, and there was some spot repairs that were done. That what was that company called? Patch Pro. Patch Pro. Um, they were able to do it uh, uh, more efficiently than we were, and we had some staffing issues that uh, we had late in the season and uh, and we, we needed to get some patching done. So, so that would kind of explain like uh, McNally wrote where they fixed one hole and drove by the next one and fixed the next one. We're, we're working on on that that crew. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so basically for the municipal services department which <coughs> includes egg services fleet, tech services utili and utilities. Um, the overall projected surplus for the whole municipal services department um, is about 264000 again not including that additional transfer to reserves for the utility department of just over 300. So we can move down to corporate services and I'll start with assessment and taxation. Um, that department is looking at a, a small surplus at this time um, and basically most of that is is just due to contract and general services, so um, it's pretty minor. And overall, he still utilized the majority of his budget as well, just a small surplus there. Uh, finance and administration in general um, are more or less combined, so there is a slight deficit there. Some of that is um, has been offset by additional tax penalties that have been collected, so it was a larger deficit for me and was offset set by additional tax penalties that we've received for this year and tax collections. Um, part of that deficit which was addressed in the 2019 budget deliberations was uh, that data entry error that was made within the uh, wages and benefits line. So we've addressed that in the budget and made that correction. So we shouldn't see that deficit there in 2019 for that line item. Um, but the um, tax penalty revenues help offset this. So it's more or less a wash between the finance and admin department and and general revenues, which includes those penalties. So um, there's a surplus in one area and a deficit in the other, and they'll be kind of washed for one another, is what we're anticipating. Uh, information technologies, they operate the same as fleet, as you know, where rates are collected on half of the department to, to fund all of their expenses. So a small surplus there, $7,000, and it's which will be a transfer to the reserve. And this is basically just due to some of the equipment and, and costs related that were needed within the year. So I know Doug has in his budget, you know, things fail, break, fall apart, so it's, it's hit or miss what's the scene or how rough we are in our equipment throughout the year. So small deficit or surplus there and that will be transferred as well to the reserve. So overall the corporate services is just gonna have a small surplus of nine thousand dollars once that that transfer is made. Our next department is community services, and uh, overall they have, for their budget, have one of the largest projected services and projected surpluses, and this is mainly due to revenues, both in the planning and development and the fire uh, emergency services, which is made up from fire calls mainly. So, um, and then in the community services administration portion, there's a surplus of 20,000 there, and a lot of this is just, again, due to um, contract services and advertising costs that are, are lower than were budgeted for the time of year. Um, not to say, 
there aren't those costs. Both of those advertising costs get eaten up with planning and development. She tends to be over a little bit in that area, so that adjustment was also made within budget for 2019. Planning and development, surplus of 44,000. As mentioned, this is due mainly to revenues. Um, the development and building permits specifically are above the budgeted revenue amounts. And miscellaneous revenues for things like compliance reports, information requests, bylaw amendments, etc., are all over the um, projected budget. So some of that, again, as we've gone to the budget deliberations, you've seen some changes in there for those revenues. Um, we expect that, uh, well, it's hard to predict, I guess, within development what's going to happen and how much is going to take place. So I know speaking with Hillary, we tried to be fair in those revenue projections and, and budget items. And then emergency services, again, this is uh, 115000 and this is mostly fire call revenues. Um, they've exceeded the, the um, $225,000 budget already. They're at almost 290000 This was at the end of October. We've since had more, and I know as we move into December specifically, um, depending on weather, of course, but there seems to be a lot of more vehicle collisions that happen at that time and, and fire calls that go out. So it's a busy department. I know Amelia is probably putting um, invoices on my desk weekly for me to approve before they go out. So, and she's very good at collections. Most of it comes through over to infrastructure. So. Um, collections are very high on fire calls. Yeah. Just for clarification, Jen, um, when you say fire calls, is that fire calls and motor vehicle accidents? Is it all in one? Um, so there, it's any call that's made. So it could be a fire call, it could be a motor vehicle collision, um, any time that a fire department is called out. Okay, so the revenue is the total of both? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. So again, um, just back to page 18, um, with all of that, we're looking at an overall surplus of 357000 which is just shy of 98% of the overall tax support being utilized. Um, page 19 just shows a different layout. Basically, this is the revenue. Oh, pardon me. You said before that the pre service there, that was a surplus of $70,000. Um, is that transferred to reserve? Yes, so fleet and IT are transferred to reserve automatically, but we do report on it. So page 19 is just another way to show the, the revenue over expenses. It just shows the revenue type by um, department or activity, just to give you a different view of it, similar to what you see in the financial statements. Um, page 20 is the cash flows for the period of August to October of 2018. So just all of our inflows and outflows for that time period, including any grants we may have received um, and any costs that may go out and transfers to investments. And page 21 just gives you a summary of the end of October. A request for investment quotes did go out, so um, it was reviewed by the um, investment committee as per the policy, so those funds will, will be transferred here shortly. Um, page 22 is just a grant summary. Um, this is just an update to include for, for council regularly just to see what we had budgeted for for grant revenues and what we've received to date. So um, the big one is the Malloy Drain Phase 2B project. Um, the funding application was resubmitted and we're just waiting to hear back. And that's 2.8 million of the nearly 7 million that we, we had budgeted for. So aside from that though, all of the grants to date have been received and projects are completed or underway. So. <coughs> and I've included there, um, um, I did a handout for you and it was just sort of a, I forgot to include it in the report and I apologize, but it's the capital project summary update. Yeah, it's just the one with the green heading. I handed it out there. So this is just a list of the projects that were approved for 2018, um, what their budget was, um, their actual to date, and just a quick status update. So anything in green, means that the project is um, completed, maybe in its warranty phase still, but has been completed. Anything in red, um, we have the one there that was a canceled project. And then the rest of the items are um, all underway for the most part. I believe there's some that will be carrying over into 2019 for completion. Um, Kip Road is one. Um, the hardtop surface 
oh, pardon me, sorry, the Shaughnessy Infrastructure Upgrades Phase 2. Um, there's been some delays there, so it was anticipated to be completed in spring of 2019. Um, bridge file 815, um, so the detailed design of the bridge is underway. Construction to, is anticipated for fall of 2019. There is a stiff application that's uh, outstanding on that one as well, so uh, I'm just waiting to hear on that. And uh, the Malloy Drain Phase 2A, so completion of this was pushed out to around March of 2019. And the Monarch Water Storage, so this one should be completed by the end of the year. It's um, performance completion is done. There's some minor deficiencies, but it's anticipated those will be completed by the end of the year and it will be fully open and operational. I think it's operational now. It's just Which? Monarch? Yeah. But the truck does not open. No, it's open. Oh, it's it's ready. Ready. So that's well, changed since it's report. So I don't know if there's any questions on the, the capital projects. So just uh, one, and that was for the Monarch mm -hmm. uh, system. Uh, it says currently as of October, you spent $1.5 million roughly and expected the total cost to be 2.1. What would be the difference to get it to the 2.1? So there likely are still some outstanding invoices on some of these projects. I know, for example, the solar panels are complete, but we haven't received an invoice yet. Um, so it's showing zero in there, but uh, you know the project is complete. So with the Monarch water storage, there'll still be some funds coming in, and there's holdbacks um, that we keep throughout the, the payments, so that's part of that too. Once those holdbacks don't get paid out until the deficiencies and everything else is met. And that's about 10%. Yeah, we just met with the engineer on Monday, Tuesday, and his, his breakdown, there was uh, a small amount remaining after the projections to complete, and uh, there's some programming that needs to be done at the booster station, so um, we're going to utilize that funds at the $0.50 cent dollars because it is an extension of the program, but those funds will be fully allocated for that project. Uh, the $1.5 million was based on what was in, in our books on our computer at the time. So there is a 10% holdback, um, and then there's some outstanding engineering fees, and then the, the contractor's final invoicing for commissioning and stuff hadn't been yet. Any other questions? Great. That's it for me. Steve? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that capital projects update report, it might help if you had the, the tender price. That way you could compare what it's supposed to cost or compare to the budget. Kind of like on page nine, you've got the fleet services. That's a very useful chart to know. Okay. Just to know what what equipment was purchased at and what it was budgeted at, just to compare. Okay, yeah, I can definitely add that. Just something that we haven't seen before, so okay. good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So Thanks. we need the motion to accept. For the discussion, call the question. Those in favor? Those opposed? Carried. So we have a 1030 appointment. As you know, we had an applied studies student from the University of Lethbridge throughout the course of the summer. And that was uh, Joe Bearhead. So she has uh, finished up and uh, we'll bring forth her report now. So I'll have to turn the floor over to Martin. Are you saying anything for you or directly to Joe? Uh, no, I'll, I'll say a few words first. Uh, formulating a preliminary response 
and emergency recovery plan. This plan will be tailored to uh, the businesses that occupy the industrial sites within the county and focusing on their economic recovery. So it has become clear in the last decade that disasters like wildfires, overland flooding, uh, tornadoes are becoming much more common across the province. And the best defense against a disaster is to have a detailed economic preparedness plan that is specific to the area, so in our case, the county.
So this is focusing on tension and expansion, and it should be able to be accessed from all over the county. So it could be a physical location, online portal, or a hotline. And the 2016 fires in the Port McMurray area, they found their hotline focused mostly on um, information on operating expenses, how to apply for funding, and marketing strategies. And from there, we can kind of move to the lessons learned from the disasters that we've experienced in the last decade. So for the wildfires in the Fort McMurray area, uh, across the literature, they found there's a real problem with communication between the public and private sectors. Uh, businesses felt extremely excluded from the process that governmental regulations were extremely confusing, didn't know how to navigate them, and they found that the timeline for permits and regulations was inefficient and thus added cost of recovery. And another kind of big uh, challenge they had with that disaster is the loss of the unskilled workforce. So that includes servers, hospitality industry, all these skilled workers need these um, unskilled workers to be able to function in their business. And maybe uh, deciding, like finding an alternative source of unskilled labor will be an issue to consider. And for the floods in 2013, Again, the communication <coughs> between the public and private sector was a huge issue. Um, they did find having a systematic uh, re-entry system really helped with uh, the recovery process as it allowed it to happen quicker and allowed recovery to be implemented faster. And in the case of water damage, um, you don't want your belongings, property to be sitting in still water for a long time that will cause more damage issues and thus add to the cost. And another thing from a huge major disaster is dealing with the emotional trauma. So that is uh, a lot of workers will not be able to come back to work as their mental health, their emotional state will not allow them to. And recovery workers really need to be trained in that part because they will be the ones that the business owners and residents will lean on, lean on for um, support. And then for the tornado case study, I chose Joplin, Missouri. In 2011, they had a tornado that was very devastating. And their biggest uh, challenges were making business retention, recovery, and expansion a priority. They focused a lot on the public sector, not on the private sector, and a lot of businesses struggle to kind of build themselves back up again and become part of the economy again. Um, they also, the tornado wiped out all main sources of <coughs> communication, uh, towers were damaged, so instead of contacting everyone through phone, email, they had to resort to other ways of communication, and that included when doing surveys, canvassing and going face to face and talking to people. And so different strategies will need to be prepared should uh, like regular communication methods be tempered. And another thing that the businesses struggled with was marketing their business after the disaster. So once all initial recovery was done, they needed help kind of changing the stigma around being a part of disaster, making sure that you're up and ready for business again and ready to accept new customers. So taking all together, uh, planning for a disaster is a really big task. <coughs> and as the county decides to move into planning for a disaster, um, there's some steps that they can take in here. I have a few recommendations. First is to establish an economic development organization. This is the heart of economic recovery and having even just a tentative list of members and key business stakeholders will help a great deal as you transition from uh, response to recovery. Second is to compile and update a list of key business um, contact information. Again, we don't want to be wasting time 
post disaster, trying to figure out new phone numbers and emails of businesses when you can be doing other things. And backing up important data on an offsite server, again, should anything happen to the administration building, um, say a tornado comes through and it's gone, um, it might even be a good idea to back up the data offsite or even in another province. And a big uh, point here is to inform businesses about emergency planning and available resources. I did a small uh, survey of a small, medium, and large business that operates in one of the, in the industrial areas, and I found that small and medium businesses are not prepared for a disaster event, and a lot of them don't know what is available to them. So even to mitigate this, we could provide an information package or host a workshop of emergency preparedness planning. Anything to prepare businesses, because again, that statistic at the beginning, 86% of businesses will fail within three years if no preparedness plan is in place, and we don't want that. And finally, having just an emergency binder. This binder will contain all important data that you will need uh, post-disaster, so this could be contact information, basic procedures, and then this can all be grabbed at once and even used for emergency scenario practicing and things like that. So taken together, it's a very brief intro and it's been a great opportunity working at the Lethbridge County. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Well, thank you very much, Gil. Any questions? Just a quick question, Jill. Thank you very much for your work, and we like having you here, so appreciate it. Um, question about the list. While you were preparing this, do we now have more of a concrete list of the businesses? You mentioned in the last slide that we need to prepare a list. So, yeah, I, like I, I haven't personally made the list, but I was uh, meaning just the important business uh, stakeholders within the community. Um, even just annually updating their uh, contact information. That's all I kind of meant from that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not sure, Jill, if, if it came up in any of your research, but just to, I guess, offer your opinion, would you say that um, municipal cities, uh, municipalities, are, are they are they doing a good job of emergency preparedness? Is this is this becoming coming more to the forefront now, as you say, like we are experiencing these disasters, or is it something that we're still lagging behind on? Um, I, I did find in the literature that it's quite biased. It's usually businesses that are writing in saying, "Oh, the government they didn't do a very good job." But yes, I do think there is a bit of a lag, and I think there is more that can be done. Um, especially in the communication area. Just building those relationships with businesses in the community helps a great deal, and they feel much more supported. So Jim, just one question I have. You mentioned 86% will fail within three years. So does that depend upon the magnitude of the, of the disaster, or is it more related to their in-preparedness and inability to sell products? Uh, from the disaster moving forward, or how does it kind of get to that number? I think it's a lot of factors. So uh, it is to do the scale of the disaster. Most of my research was the huge fires, the big floods, the big tornadoes, and that like wiped out everything. And I think the lack of planning and relationships between the public and private sector, so the governments and the businesses, um, really kind of made that much more difficult to recover from and then them not having the resources to market themselves properly. So I think it is a mixture of everything and I think preparedness is the answer. Okay, thank you. Klaus? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you were talking about uh, emergency preparedness quite a bit, of course, and uh, so the bigger business stuff like that, do most of them have a plan in place or are uh, 
is there a lack of, uh, and that's what you mentioned too, a lack of uh, <coughs> government and the, and the big businesses, because uh, the smaller ones, uh, I guess it's a little bit difficult uh, for them to have emergency plans the way they're the larger. Yeah, in the survey I did, I did speak to a larger business in the community, and they, quote, said they're as, as prepared as they can be. So they have a corporate office that has legislative or policies in place for whatever disaster. And so I think it's really the smaller and medium businesses that we should be focusing on because the larger ones have bigger resources and assets. So it wouldn't affect them as much. Any other questions? Yes. Larry. Oh. Larry and then Morris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jill, you spoke about the importance of establishing an economic development organization, I believe you called it. And who would be some of the organizations and or people involved in that and part of that? What would you represent? So um, the econo economic development officers, um, relevant departments of government, or the county, um, key business, business uh, stakeholders, uh, chamber of commerce, and other kind of relevant representatives. So that could be the provincial government, federal government, any agencies even. Thank you. <coughs> Morris? Okay. Any other questions? No, go ahead, Martin. Mr. Chairman and members of council, um, uh, I just really, I think that this is something that, you know, again, we hope it never comes, and yet I'm sure Fort McMurray, Calgary, High River, so many other places, you know, they always, everybody hopes this day never comes. And so this really is good. It gives uh, myself and potentially council and senior administration down the road a bit of an idea of, of where we can go. We're just kind of scratching the surface right now, but I think it's one of those things where a little bit of prevention and planning and foresight should the worst ever happen allow us to respond much better and more effectively not so much in the immediate disaster we've got good emergency services plans well-trained people that's not the issue it's that recovery as jill was specifying the period in the months and years afterwards as everybody tries to rebuild including the business community and that's where the vulnerability and the lack of support can really be there i think that's what Jill highlighted. So it's been very useful for me, but this is just a starting point, and I'll be taking this further forward. And Mr. Chairman, if I could just request, um, we'll maybe do that small yes. presentation to uh, Jill right now. Okay, Morris, you've got for all of them. Further moved? 
Chair Thorne, thank you. Any further yes. discussion? Call for the question. Those in favor? Those opposed? Carry. Thank you. Okay, let's move back to E2, quarterly report or third quarter report for planning and development. Glory. And that's on pages 23 through 25. Is it <laughs> the shortest one I have today? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Council. Uh, my quarterly report, I will have to admit, is a little bit late because mine goes from July to September and it's December. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> it's been busy. Um, but so this is my quarterly report till the end of September. Uh, with regards to uh, some of the, I'll just briefly go through the report um, and then if there's any questions the council. Um, you heard some of uh, the information or saw some of it from Jen's report also and she gives more of the numbers or the, the financials with it so I don't give uh, that information in my report. So the projects that we've been working on uh, up to this year, uh, to the end of September where we did uh, the Hamlet growth strategies, more specifically the modern growth strategy was approved by council on the end of June. And the Iron Springs and Turin uh, growth strategies are, are well underway. Uh, we are actually sending out a survey for the Turin growth strategy today. Um, so that's uh, moving forward. We'll do the one for Iron Springs probably in the next couple weeks. The land use bylaw amendment, uh, we did the, the, the large amendment with regard to the Modernized Municipal Government Act and the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan. Uh, that Those amendments were approved by council in August. We also at that time, at that same time, as you recall, the municipal development plan was updated uh, for, once again, the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan and the Modernized Municipal Government Act, just bringing that up to date. We did amend the land use bylaw to address the uh, legalization of cannabis, and that was done in October, or finalized in October. And also, we've been uh, slowly but surely working on our fire pond policy. Uh, but the inventory has been completed uh, by county staff. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, just we have some further work to do on the viability of some of those uh, the hydrants. So we need to do some testing prior to uh, finalizing that inventory and seeing where things are with regards to that particular infrastructure. And I'll be working with the municipal services department on that. With regards to development permitting, we had 143 development permits uh, submitted at the end of September, and 132 permits were issued. Uh, one permit was denied and 10 applications were still in circulation at that time. Um, as you notice in, in under development permits, most of our permits are under the residential and accessory building category. Uh, but we did have a, um, a number, we had 12 industrial commercial applications come in, a number of agricultural buildings, uh, some signage applications, and then also uh, quite a few home occupations compared to this time last year. So um, that's good, it means there's small businesses kind of incubating in the county, which is great. In 2017, just as a note though, we did, we were down from the number of applications we had last year. I think last year was just, uh, we had a phenomenal year with regards to development permitting. This year we're seeing, I, it's not necessarily a correction, but um, just, uh, it's, it's quite a bit less. It'll probably be a lot less by the end of the year than compared to last year. Um, but that was to be anticipated with um, just how the economy's going and, and just, the ebbs and flows with regards to permitting. So that's why it's a little bit hard when we're doing budgeting to capture how much is actually gonna happen in a given year because we really don't know what those uh, trends will be until we're pretty much halfway through the year. With regards to the building permitting, which is done uh, through contract with Park Enterprises, they have received a total of 461 permits and that includes uh, building, plumbing, electrical, gas, and private sewage permits. Um, so that's been uh, very successful. We've had a uh, very good relationship with Park and, and working through, um, we've had a, a few things that have come up um, just in terms of dealing with people not getting the appropriate permits and that's been working out very well. For subdivisions, uh, the council as the subdivision authority has made decisions on 13 subdivision applications, 11 were approved and two have been refused. And one, went, uh, one refusal did go to the appeal to the appeal board, and which was, so that one was refused by the subdivision authority. 
the appeal was upheld and the subdivision development appeal board approved that subdivision just so you're aware with regards to redesignations uh, we have had as you are aware a number of redesignations come in to the county uh, there was the Iron Springs redesignation uh, where we were just kind of cleaning up the C old CPR rail land there. There is the amendment uh, for the Norland, which was approved. The Cooley View area structure plan, uh, the redesignation was uh, defeated by council. And uh, we have eight other redesignations that are currently under review and coming forward to council. So it has been a very busy fall. With regards to area structure plans, we have had three that are um, have been reviewed or and are going through the review process. So there is the Cooley View Area Structure Plan, which was approved, the Chinook Industrial Park, which was approved just at the last council meeting, and later um, at the last meeting in December here, we'll have the Area Structure Plan come forward for the Blue Stone Ranch Area Structure Plan, which is a residential subdivision application. With regards to intermunicipal relations, um, there hasn't been, I would say, a lot of meetings going on this year with regards to intermunicipal relations, but we have made um, some good progress on the planning side. Uh, the MD in Tabor and Lethbridge County IDP was approved. Same with the Picture Butte and Lethbridge County IDP. And then uh, with regards to the Coal Town of Coaldale, they have gone through their annexation request, as you were aware, and it was approved in April. And so we will have to do an update to that particular plan, the I Pinch Mesa Development Plan, to just bring that into conformance with the new boundaries. Um, and we are uh, currently working on the Rural to Rural IDP. So there's four of those that we are working towards with the MT of Willow Creek, Walton County, Carston County, and the County of Warner. And um, those ones, uh, I think, will be progressing quite uh, nicely throughout the beginning of 2019. With regards, Hillary, to the IDP with the Village of Barrens, we mm -hmm. did briefly have a conversation about the possibility of setting up a committee because I don't believe we have a committee right now. Is that correct? That's correct. So um, the last urban one that is outstanding is, as Anne mentioned, the Barrens IDP. So uh, we have put it in the budget for next year to do that. Um, it should be a relatively uh, uh, I would say it's Barron's isn't a large community, so I think that should be a fairly smooth process to go through. But we should set up a committee with uh, a council to, to do that because there are some things to consider in terms of their growth that they're anticipating in the next uh, 25 years, and then also how if there's anything around in the county that we want to address. We do have the, that one wind farm that is in that general area, so that might be trying to play in that. So it'll be a little bit more complex than the world to world, so I think a community council would be appropriate for that particular. So plan. just a suggestion, perhaps we can in January bring forward a report with a recommendation for a committee for that? Yes, that okay. is. Yeah, I think we'll be doing that. We have to make contact probably with Barron's just to, to discuss um, administratively some parameters around that. And their size of their council is quite small too, so we want to. Have three, three, three councillors, yeah. so. <clears throat> Thanks, Lauren. Um, I think that that's a very brief overview of the planning and development department's um, activities up until the end of September, and um, I will be bringing a, a year-end report um, in the new year, which is usually a bit more detailed. Any questions? I have one. When you talked about permit problem, Park Enterprises. Park Enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, when you said they have 400 and some permits, like how many permits would you need to get to build the, say, a new house or a new facility? Do you so does that say if you were building something new, you would have maybe five or six permits for one? So would you divide that number down a bit to get to the actual for the actual structure? Of building <clears throat> Yes, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. There is um, usually when you're building a new house or a commercial building, you would have your building permit, you would have an electrical, you would have a plumbing and gas, um, and depending on your municipal services, if there's a, a septic, private septic being put in. So there would probably be on average around four permits for a brand new structure. And then we have a lot of uh, renovations that go on. So those also, you know, you have put in a new electrical panel, um, putting in a new, maybe a natural gas system or a fireplace, um, re, you know, maybe your septic system needed to be redone, so you're putting in a new septic. So you find a lot of one-offs too, with regards to not so much the building side, but the um, other disciplines. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Cross. I'll uh, move this uh, for WG. This is a great motion. Any further discussion? Call for the question. Those in favor? Vote. Carried. Thank you, Hillary. Yeah. Okay, let's move down to G1, bylaw 18 028. Expanded for commitment to land use from rural agricultural to rural general industrial. Page uh, 119, or 111 to 119. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, this is for first reading of bylaw 18028, which is uh, for Mr. Rex Vandenberg, and it's an amendment to the land use bylaw from rural agriculture to rural general industrial. And it's in the Northeast 351021 West of the Fourth. So just pull that up on the screen. It is also in your agenda package on uh, page 115. So this application has been submitted by the landowner um, to accommodate a future berry storage and processing facility. Uh, so the use is not a use that is considered either permitted or discretionary under the Rural Agricultural District because it's a commercial or industrial operation. So they have come in to apply to amend it to an industrial district to, um, in the hopes of uh, building a uh, future berry storage uh, and processing <coughs> facility in this location. If the application is approximately one mile east of the town of Picture Butte, off of high, directly off of Highway 519, and uh, the application has been sent to the external um, agency, so Alberta Transportation, more specifically, because it does go up right up 519, and also to the internal um, county departments for review. And it is anticipated that we would have the public hearing for this particular bylaw in January of 2019. Questions of council on this application at this time? I assume that's the berry farm we were on the egg on the uh, tour. Was it? Yes, yes, yeah. it is. Yeah, just th this uh, past fall. Okay. A little bit. So, what do you get up against the highway? Uh, the, this is just for the processing or storage facility itself. So their um, berry farm areas are th kind of throughout the county. It's through a consortium. So this is where they want a hub to bring in the product to one location. And so this is, um, since Mr. Vandenberg is part of that consortium, this is um, an area where they've identified that would be good for this type of facility. Okay, any other questions? Move for first reading then. Move so far. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Call for the question. Those in favor? Those opposed? Carried. And uh, well, number two also, we should probably wait until after the public hearing. Should be. This is just for first reading, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, so um, it doesn't have any standing on the public ring. It's a different okay. property. Okay, let's do number two then. File 18-029, pages 120 to 135. Clause. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, you want to hear it? Yeah, you want to hear it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, th as, as mentioned, this is just for first reading of, uh, the by of this particular bylaw, and it is for um, a portion of the northwest 191022, a portion of the southeast, and a portion of the southwest 191022. And it is for to facilitate a co solar collector facility. As you can see that on the map that's located on uh, page 127, so it's encompassing one title and then the dry corners of two other parcels. And this application is for approximately 124 acres to facilitate, as I mentioned, a solar collect facility. 
the application is required as uh, the project does not meet the standards of the land use bylaw, which directs solar facilities to um, non-irrigated uh, and titles under 80 acres. So they've uh, chosen to come forward with the direct control bylaw. This application has been sent to external agencies, including um, Alberta Transportation, CP Rail, Alberta Environment for their review, and also to the internal county departments. And it has anticipated for this particular application that we would have the public hearing in January of 2019 also. Any questions? We have a motion on the floor by Klaus to go to first reading. Seeing none, call for the question. Those in favor? Those opposed? Carried. Okay, let's move now to page one, page 136 to 138. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. And that is Chelsea and Bates Legal Project. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. 
Clarity too, Rick, you did mention that in the 2019 budget there was some base stabilization, but through the budget deliberations we put that on hold, correct? correct. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. there's no miles added for 2019. Okay. It's in the five year plan starting in 2020 with 10 miles. Okay. And then we're going to have a review after 2019 yeah. to have an idea of where our costs are. Yeah. Thank you. One, one, thing, one thing you have to remember, just back to your question, Lauren, is that. Uh, the way that the um, the gravel supply contract is is worded, 
um, or the way that they tendered it, the county is broken into zones. And there was what, eight zones or? Like there's 10, 10, 10 zones. And each of them had a different dollar value per tone for delivery. So up close to the colony and where the final miles that we finished was say $5 a tone for delivery where way at the extents in the, in the far south east or uh, west of the city could have been at 10 to $12 a tone. So that can change the cost per mile quite substantially just based on where the miles are being done in the county and how far they are on the whole distance. Um, so that's why we talk about the average cost per mile across the board. Any other questions? Yes, well, Mars. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. Uh, what was the before we started the uh, Hall Road uh, uh, plan? What was the original cost per mile again? I, I forgot. It was the, wasn't it even at a thousand? No. Well, it was one ten. One ten. Yeah, and then we added a thousand dollars contingency, kind of in. It, it, the number that we put in for the borrowing bylaw was 111000 per mile, and that's the uh, 117 times 111 gives you the $13 million. And then the follow-up is, uh, you know, due to the dry weather, we had an extra cost. What, what was the extra cost, like uh, water and uh, pothole fixing and all of that? Yeah, so there was a, a fair amount of additional watering that had to be done. Uh, some modifications to the gravel supply contract by adding water at the plant so that we didn't get segregation um, and we were able to get adequate compaction. Uh, we modified the schedule of the gravel hauling so that they didn't get too far ahead of us because the gravel on the road, whatever moisture was in there during the dry weather was basically dissipating into the air. Um, the dry weather showed us that we were vulnerable to uh, that extreme weather condition, so we had to do additional testing and trying to figure out what that dry weather was doing to our mix design. Um, so there was all those factors, and, and the bulk of the expense was going back and doing repairs. Um, a little bit of extra calcium addition that, that, and that's the bulk of it, and watering. Watering was a, a, a big part of it. Yeah. Just for um, new members of council and for me, um, I'm in the process of kind of outlining a memo, and hopefully I'll get it to you next week, but it just kind of says exactly all the resolutions that came forward to council with the hallmark, uh, the access, whatever. Right, access. Thank you, thank you and um, all the different um, iterations of the reports and the policies. So I'm hoping to have that to you next week and I think it would add some clarity to the different terminology and background too, so thanks. Any other questions or discussion? Morris? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, there is a lot of, still a lot of people in the county uh, who uh, absolutely don't know for sure what the cost is, you know, I've been telling them, you know, well, I think 80% is the gravel, right? Yeah. And uh, if you realize, you know, how the number of gravel you put on down there, it has to last quite a, year, quite a few years more than when you do regular gambling. However, the people in the county, the ratepayers, don't seem to realize that. Yeah, the, I think, we'll, the idea is that we'll put out a, uh, an information package showing them what uh, the benefits that we've gained. Um, I think we'll keep it to more of a general terms. If we get into the technical side and structural rating and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's probably a little more technical than people need to, to hear. Uh, we, we'll keep that to ourselves in here. But that's basically what we did is we added structure to the road and we chose a chemical to treat it, to stabilize it, to hold that mix in the best recipe that we could to, uh, um, 
to give us the, the benefits that we need, lessening the, uh, the effect of road bans on those roads, lessening the dust impacts, um, creating a, a hard surface that was safer to drive on, um, all those type of things. And it's as close as we can get right now to a hard top surface without the expense. Um, and those, type, those are the messages that need to get out there and they're a consistent message coming from our crews out in the field, whether it's the greater operator talking to a farmer on the side of the road, or whether it's at the uh, political level, or with the provincial government. I mean, they're looking at this very closely, and we've done a project for the province, so obviously um, they feel it's a, it's a reasonable solution to uh, the expense of hard top roads that, that we just can't afford to build. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the way I understand it, the initial uh, amount of money that we uh, borrowed for this was $13 million. Correct. Now we're, we're uh, looking at increasing the, uh, the borrowing by a lot to 454. No. And so where are we going to fund that from? Is that, is that from the same uh, business tax or is that yes. from a different source? Yeah, the, the entire adventure will be paid for through the business tax. Okay, but does, that doesn't mean that we're going to have an increase in that. Not in the business tax. What we've done is we've taken the, the allocation of the business tax and it was broken down into percentages going to bridges, into haul routes, and hardtop reserve. So those percentages, we've just adjusted those percentages to cover the business tax for haul routes is paying the entire debenture and the new debenture amount that we're suggesting today if, if it gets approved. Thank you. So Bob, I want to move this, but I just have a question. The way the motion is written, aren't we doing uh, G3 at the same time? Well, we'll do it right after. Well, well this is just... I think you can receive this for information okay. Okay. and then go to the, to the yeah. file office. Okay. In my opinion. You know, the first you get your kind of oh, oh, we need the reserve money. So we need the, the, we need the bottom... The, the, uh, the first recommendation there could just be to authorize administration to prepare the borrowing bylaw. And then I'll bring forward the board by yeah. right after you're done with it. Okay. Okay. So you making that bomb? Yes. Yeah. Bring forward. Very quickly, if you want to make the update, the numbers came in. Uh, 2016 um, was very close to the plant that was 12 old, most for the most part, and the test code, which was up in the north uh, uh, east, at uh, 110,000 a mile, which is where we got our budget number from. 2017, we did 41 miles, and the average cost was $135,000 a mile. And a lot of that was, uh, like I said, a lot of long haul distance, uh, being in the south and the southeast. Um, but that's where we ran into all the issues with the dry weather and fixing our, our program. And in 2018, we did 80 miles at $102,300 per mile for a total average of $113,500 per mile across the 
So just a question. The uh, the uh, reserve you're going to use, where does that money go? <coughs> How do we put the money into that reserve? Is that from the business tax? Yes, that was unspent uh, monies from the business tax the first year that they did. First what is that combination? Uh, that's just money that is unspent has been transferred back to the reserve. So that is business tax collected and that will deplete that reserve. So we okay. have fully utilized it. All business tax revenues collected. Okay. Good enough. Any other questions? So call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, let's go to G3. That's bylaw 18-033, the amendment to bylaw 1491. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and this was a handout. This was a, a further to our discussion on Monday about the budget uh, deliberations there that we would bring us forward today if that project was approved, as is, that we just did. So I have prepared the borrowing bylaw. It is just an amendment to the initial borrowing bylaw, number 1491, to increase the amount from 13 million to 13,454. Most of my report is just a reiteration of what you just heard from Rick there. There is a, not a requirement to advertise as per the MGA if the costs do not exceed 15% of the initial project, so we don't have to go through the advertising uh, requirement there. So we can go for all three readings today, and uh, I will put a call in once this is approved to the ACFA to see if we can squeeze this in for the December 15th. It, it might, it'll be pretty close, but. Um, We'll see if not, it'll go through on the March one. We, as we have applied for the fourth um, venture already, but they may be able to amend that a little bit. We'll see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How long is the, the venture for? 30 years. Sorry. 30 years. Okay. So they'll be paid off the, the, because there's actually four separate adventures and five if they consider this one separately. So each one is a 30 year term. So it'll be 30, 31 years. Hey, any, any discussion? We need first reading of bylaw 18 033 then. So we use one question. Yes, you bet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure, we probably have it someplace, but I would like to see the different types of dimensions we have on that, on certain uh, issues. For sure, like a list of all outstanding dimensions right now? Uh, yeah, Jen can prepare that and send, uh, send it to Anne for submission to your inboxes. We did reduce quite significantly the sort of number of debentures outstanding because of the airport. So a lot of them got transferred to the city, which. Okay. Any further discussion? Those in favor of first reading? Opposed? Second reading? All those up. Any discussion? Call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And then go to third. This has to be unanimous. Those in favor? Those opposed? Carried. And third reading. All those up. Favor. Those opposed. Carry now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go down to administration. Here's one thirty nine to one forty. County Council. December 17th. 
just for background during budget deliberations it came up that the last meeting in december was very close to christmas and there was a um, uh, request from some members of council and staff to move the meeting to the 17th and that's what this report is in aid of there is public meetings on that date too but we've met our requirements publishing and notice in time that if the meeting does get changed Any discussion? Was it favor? Was it both? Okay, let's do number two, emergency services both on Colvale. 141 to 146. different fire emergency services and the escalating costs throughout the year. Um, we'll also uh, have more reports coming forward because it's quite complex. There's very different levels. There's emergency service provision, there's fire service provision north and south of the river, and there's also our agreement with the City of Lethbridge. As we know, um, the City of Lethbridge and the County's agreement expires on the 31st of December. We have given them notice for the agreement that we want to renegotiate that. We've had some initial meetings with the City and we do have more meetings tomorrow to talk about the escalating costs of the fire service delivery, not just there but also with the other uh, fire service providers as well. We have um, been approached by the Town of Coaldale um, given that we we no longer have emergency management personnel to provide uh, emergency management provision to the county the cost would be forty thousand per year no capital cost this cost is based on the percentage of time the current emergency management uh, emergency manager in coaldale spends on emergency management because he does have other duties as well that it's an effective um, for 2019 to enter into this agreement uh, for the county because we do plan on using 2019 as a year to uh, wade through the fire agreements and work with the urban and the city to get more equitable agreements. Currently right now the county is really very reactive when it comes to the cost of fire services, both capital and operating, and very often we're getting asked for different requests. We need to solidify the agreements between the urbans. They've agreed to that, and that's another report. For this report right now, the Town of Coaldale requested that we perform emergency services, fire inspection, and fire investigations. Now, we've had some meetings with Chief Fire Marshal from the city, and um, and those agreements, one of the concerns of the actual people doing the firefighting is they would like to be doing the inspections when they're responding to the fire. So they're familiar with the building and when their firefighters are going in, they know exactly what to expect. So I'm just going to go over to the map here, but what, I, what my recommendation is after speaking to the city and the town of Coldale is that we have whoever's responding to the fire area do the inspections in that area so they are familiar with the buildings they're responding to. So I'll just go over the map and if you can talk through it, Larry. Sure thing. That, that's correct. The city's response zone is the yellow zone that Anne's pointing out, the green zone to the south and to the very west, the light green there, those three distinct geographic areas. And then this, this is Coldale. Coldale, that's right, the very, very large uh, southeast quarter, in fact, of the entire county, just about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The uh, purple color is 
Parkview. The other green is Barron's, and the other one is Culver's. Yep. That's correct. Or Noble Bird. Noble Bird. Oh, sorry, no, Noble Bird. Yes. The dark green in the top in the northwest corner is Noble Bird. Barron's. Barron's. And then Noble Bird. Can you point, Bob? Thanks. Good job, Bob. And then the pink is Pitcher View. So the other request was for fire investigations as well, and both the city and the town of Coaldale are qualified and willing to do the investigations. And my thought is also investigation and inspections, they could fall, the city could do it in their area and Coaldale could do it in their area. So that's what we're recommending. Um, we have another meeting tomorrow with the city manager and with his, um, what's he called it? Director of Court Community yeah. Services. So um, we will be discussing the costs and looking at a new funding model. Um, the request from, proposal from the town of Coaldale right now is $100 an hour for inspections, no mileage. Uh, the city would is currently providing them for $100 with mileage, but now that we've got some bargaining power, they may drop the mileage. So the cost is relatively um, similar. The problem too is we have a quality management plan. It's a fire quality management plan. And we need to make sure that under that quality management plan, we're meeting the inspections yearly that we need to do. Um, also with conversations with our planner, um, there's a quality management plan for buildings. These two uh, documents need to be combined because I think that there's been some missing pieces in the fire inspection of new buildings. So we're going to work on that internally as well. Just if, if I may, uh, further to what uh, Ann said, uh, Mr. Chairman and Council, when we met with the City of Lethbridge Fire Marshal, his perspective and a professional opinion, and, and I think it's uh, valid and solid, is that the response zone, and Ann, Ann did touch on this, but he said it, it just doesn't make sense uh, to pursue uh, fire response without also having the fire inspections. They, they go hand in hand. And in fact, he added the investigation piece, which is smaller, that's post-disaster event. So fortunately, there aren't too many of those. But he really stressed the importance and the efficiencies and life safety aspect of maintaining that fire response zone as the identical zone that that same responding organization would do the inspections for. Thanks. So, I understand that as you move forward and change things, but this seems to be getting a little more unclear daily. And uh, so, if you go by the scenario you just put forward, then this motion makes no sense. So, we would have to clearly come up with something different than this. So, but are those other municipalities, Nobleford, uh, Barron's, uh, Picture Butte, are they? qualified to do inspections as of yet? No. Or how does that work? No. Um, so what ideally, um, Mr. Chair, it would be that once the um, fire departments north of the river were qualified, my understanding is they're about two to three months away. And I know it seems it is unclear. The alternative is to leave the city doing all the inspections. So if you leave the city doing all the inspections, they're doing inspections in the area where Coaldale is responding. So Coaldale's request is that they're responding to the areas they're inspecting. And it does seem unclear, but if we, once the um, fire departments in the north are qualified, they would be responding to their areas. I guess that didn't answer your question. Well, I understand where you're going. But I guess what, what's the difference between the city inspecting a facility and Coldale inspecting? Don't they create a report and give it to the fire department? So I guess if the person who did the inspection isn't actually at the fire, if they have a fire, what difference does it make? They're not going to know any different from one report to the next. That's where I'm confused on yeah. it. And, and I think they are. The people who inspect actually are on the fire department, so they are responding. That's my understanding. So they would be familiar with the building. The um, fire marshal from the city mentioned that there was buildings that they didn't inspect. They ended up having to go into that building, and there were chemicals there that they weren't aware of. 
because they hadn't done the inspection. So that was the challenge from their end that they were seeing. Yeah, Kim. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, fire inspections are all the same for all the buildings and everything else like that. And and I would really, really hope because according, if everybody's going to do their own fire inspection, that they would make a plan and give it to every other uh, fire department because we don't know how many alarms are going to be sent out and and uh, we have other people coming in from um, like around the, the municipalities they need to know what's going on and they must there's got to be one thing I, I, I find it I, I thought we were going to do one inspection or whatever it is like in, in, in um, the line that's set for I, I just don't see Stephen uh, uh, Troy can think that what would be the advantage of every fire hall having a fire inspection because they're all going to have to share it with everybody else anyway and I think that if you, if you, if you just leave it as one then they all know which one is done or not. Well, I think I agree with you, and I think when we get to the point where it's more regionalized, certainly that should be the case. So what you're suggesting is leave it all the inspections either with Coaldale or with the city. Is that what you're suggesting? At this point in time, yes. Making sure they share the information. Well, they, and they must, they have to. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, it's no use just doing it because you'd have to get, in this scenario, you're taking one member from every fire department to go in and look at the same building. Yeah, and that's fine. And this is coming directly from the firefighters themselves that they prefer to do the inspections oh, in yeah. their area. I'm yeah. not arguing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Bob, I did more. That's, I think the reason you're trying to state this is they want to do the separate is because they don't know what's in each building. So if they're going out for the fire, the one who's going out the fire or killing the fire knows what's in the building and that's why they want to do the inspection. Well, that, they, they would have that well, information. Well, will they share it between the way? Yeah, they're going to. Well, I'm sorry, we would hope they would. Yeah, if yeah. they don't, then what's the use of doing it? Of course. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that's actually the question I was going to ask, you know, uh, that uh, whoever does the uh, fire inspection or or whatever, it should be available to all sites of the river, or for that matter, all of the county, through however they're going to make it available. But it should be available. That's the way. That's the way I can look at it. That's the way it's going to be set up. And I mean, certainly moving forward, we can make sure that happens. But there's always been a kind of disconnect between the different fire departments, and that's what we're trying to get. And through the Joint Chiefs Committee, there seems to be some kind of agreement for joint purchasing, joint training, and whatnot. So we're getting there, but are we there yet? I don't know. So the options open to us is um, emergency services, if we want to share with Coaldale, we can try it out for a year. It would cost the county $40,000. Uh, we can leave it like that. Fire inspections can either be with the city or with Coaldale for now. And the third one is the investigations as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. The emergency services shouldn't be in part of that because of uh, inspections and the investigations are stuff that is done without the fire. But I, because I, we're getting into more caucus, but the way I see it. Yeah. Troy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I would have to, I think the wording is the, the problem I have when we say emergency services. What are, what are we at? Are we talking about a coordinator position or are we talking about a, a dam? I, the emergency services is where I, just those okay. two words there is where I have my issue because I think like Ken said, we're speaking to something. For clarity, for clarity and apologize for that. What it is, it would be somebody, and, it, and in the report it kind of spells it out a bit better, but 
um, the the DEM or the um, what's that stand for? Director of Emergency Management would be jointly shared, so it actually should be emergency. Um, what would you call it? Call it disaster Blair response. calls it disaster response. So that's the coordinated position. The reason I put three things in there is because the proposal from Coldale came with the three requests. So that's what they were saying we would like to do. We're not saying that we have to take it up. It's just a proposal that came from Coldale. So what the proposal is, number one, provide disaster management by hiring, paying for the joint um, dam from the town of Coldale in an amount of 40000 a year. And this would get us through 2019, our planning phase, and redoing the agreements with the fire departments. And it would be a year to try and plan and figure out what we're doing with the other parts of the fire services because there's so many moving pieces with emergency services, fire and disaster management and the inspections and the investigation, like it's like an onion, the more you open it, the more it's complex. But what my recommendation would be just to do the disaster management for one year, see if the partnership works out with Coldale. With regards to the last two, we can leave things status quo. Um, it's completely up to council, but my recommendation is for a year. It would save the county about 90000 a year just by doing the disaster management. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. By leaving uh, the inspection status quo, it, it doesn't work with the city. I mean, they, yeah. they do inspections whenever they, they can. So in my opinion, the agreement we have with them has pretty much failed because they're, they're not getting the inspections done. At least Coldale would take the initiative to do the ones in their area at least. So at least we're getting something done. So I have a, another question. So they're $40,000 a year to do disaster management and their other proposal was $100 an hour to do fire inspection. That's above the 40000 Yes. So if we have a flood, then the, the town of Coldale is going to provide the dam for the flood? Yes. Oh, I have trouble with that. Yeah. One of the things too is there is money under provincial funding and the only way, it, you know, if we did decide to go through the disaster management, um, and uh, I think we can get up to 75,000. Um, the proposal from Coldale also stated that if we did it more regionally and if we practiced more regionally, that we would be more effective responding to an emergency. So, I mean, there is that, that was put out there. Um, I guess I wasn't here for the last flood. I'm not sure how it worked, if it was effective or not. I'm sure you can remember that because it wasn't that long ago. Larry, did you want to speak to that? Or? 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a couple points uh, to to the discussion. Um, supporting and, and appreciating what Councillor Steve Campbell mentioned about the number of fire inspections. The city has openly admitted they're not able to perform the number of fire inspections annually that they should be and we you know technically have responsibility for Lethbridge County that is um, meeting our quality management plan so if just as an example if those inspections were shared and Coldale picked up a large piece of them their indication is that they could ramp that number up significantly and get more inspections done in a shorter period of time than the city is currently able to. That's just one point. One other piece we haven't talked about it much, but a little bit, is that reform fire investigations. You will recall that currently, Lethbridge County pays a $6,000 retainer for fire inspections to an, uh, an outside company. And that's even if there are no inspections in a given year, we're still paying that $6,000. If we gave that piece over to the city of Lethbridge or the town of Coldale or split it or however, we would right out of the gate save that $6,000 up front annually and they would bill us and charge us only when fire investigations occurred and they would charge us you know, a similar amount to the private company, again, without that $6,000 retainer. Clause. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So who's doing the inspections then in Big Tribute and that area? Is that also the city? And, and just to expand on that too, one of the issues, and I we found um, Jill Muirhead's conversation interesting today because that would be another aspect of 
disaster recovery, you know how that would fit in. But um, one of the challenges internally, we don't have a broad list of all the buildings. So in the city's defense, not only do they not have the time, but they also it took them quite a bit of um, time to locate the different commercial and industrial businesses in the county because we don't have a comprehensive list of that. So there is that piece as well. But that would lead to another question. How will the next person be able to do it then? We do now have a better list. It's not complete though. Well, I, I'm, I'm still opposed to somebody else running our damn our emergency. I, I just think that that's our responsibility to do that. I, for fire, I think it might be different, but for, because uh, we don't actually have a fire department, but for anything else, I, I mean, seeing that as an issue to me, I mean, how is some other municipality gonna really fully understand the situation that's occurring so far removed from them? Well, the recommendation would be that it would be a one-year trial period. This would be a joint dem. He would work for the town of Coaldale, but he would do training in Coaldale and also here with our staff. There are members of our staff, Tracy, Rick, and, and uh, Larry, who are already emergency management trained. The training would happen jointly here and at the town of Coaldale. Um, I'm not suggesting it's a perfect solution. I'm suggesting that it's a temporary solution. And if the partnership didn't work, we could certainly review it. It's one option. Any other comments? Go ahead, Kim. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I would feel a lot better if it was a short term. Them because I, we've, the biggest problem we've had in the past is too many contracts out there. And I don't want to see that happening again. And then and the, uh, the dam is, is unique to each municipality. So when you say short term, six months or a year? Well, how short? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I personally don't have a problem with the year, but just to piggyback on that, I, I think we've kind of all hit on a few different things here. Could we, at this point in time, send this back to administration to, to work with Lethbridge and Coldell and come back to us with a clearer proposal that identifies who's doing those, those inspections, who's going to cover that north region that currently doesn't have someone, and, and uh, maybe just if we could further address the, the Reeves concerns, I, I, I completely understand where he's coming from, just that we have a better peace of mind that for that year we have someone that can address our needs. And here's a suggestion too, would you like the actual dam or the town of Coaldale to come and do a proposal to council? Would that be helpful? With an administrative report as well. Or would you just rather have the administrative report? It's up to you guys. Your call. Oh, I, I certainly think if they're willing to come, it might be a better understanding for all of us. Okay. Yep. We can do that. <laughs> Go ahead, Ken. I would probably go with Tori and if the administration does it, because I don't, I don't want to get council in between fire departments right now. Okay. Just an administrative report with more clarity on who's doing what and what the cost can be. You guys can give us the information. Okay. It'll be easier too because after tomorrow our meeting with the city will have a little better idea to moving forward what they're proposing for costs as well too to provide fire services. So, so what time frame would you suggest you would bring this back to the January meeting or? January or February. Yeah. To be realistic. Well, I know it would have to be January because we are <coughs> running out of time. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, like we, we've um, we haven't said that we're not going to sign a new contract, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's. I mean, you could deal with that part of it. At the end of the per uh, per our agreement with the city, 
we need to give six months notice that we're going to negotiate and we did that in July or end of June to make sure. So, okay. so we're okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Most of us haven't been in the emergency operating center when it's operating to know what the director of emergency management really does. Does does the different units like someone from Coldell, does that geography difference gonna make a difference or are are they just kind of going by a document or I mean Mr. Chairman through to Councillor Steve Campbell. Um, you know, I, I think there's, you know, advantages to knowing your local area and geography for sure. That's a, I think that's a given we can all accept. But then beyond that, under the Alberta Emergency Management System, all DEMS and all responses go under the Incident Command System. So they're all trained uh, under the, the same basic rules and framework. So training from one municipality definitely, definitely transfers to another municipality. That's a non-issue and a non-question. The, the whole structure of the Emergency Operations Center is identical municipality to municipality, depending on the scale of the response and the disaster at hand, of course, but you know, fundamentally very transferable indeed. So I, I, you know, my own opinion, my, my recommendation is that is not a, a, you know, a, a negative or a, a, a problem for the county if someone from the outside uh, came in to be our den during a, a disaster event. The only variable there maybe is their knowledge of the local geography and, and people and contacts and so on, but you know, hopefully the rest of the team could pick that up and fill in any holes. Go ahead, Steve. Because really at the end of the day, the dam is in the EOC, which is in the building. They're not out in the, they're not out in the field. They're getting information from those that are out there and making decisions that way anyway. So whether it's a county employee or not, I don't know if it makes that much difference but yes and, and um, we do have deputy dams internally too that are familiar with the thing too so you are accurate they would be here at the command center yeah no that, that's correct i mean heaven forbid uh, this evening you know if there's a disaster we have to respond we have uh, at least three people on staff who will go down into our emergency operations center and take on that role of dam right now. Um, you know, we may not uh, have the level of knowledge and depth of knowledge and experience that we have had at Lethbridge County in the past, but that doesn't mean we're not qualified and naturally any of us would step in uh, when called upon and give our very best effort for it and, and do what we needed to do. And I have to um, make note too that Larry, early on in his term here, made sure that we changed all the job descriptions for every county employee who came in after after this point that they were certified in emergency management so we've now made that a requirement for every new employee and then a lot of the other employees have brought that up to snuff so we made sure that we have right through the organization that you know depth of knowledge there thanks mr chairman one other point uh, just came to mind as well if uh, we're going a little bit different direction than what the original recommendation on the report was and that is under the emergency management act council needs to a appoint a director of emergency management and with recent staff changes right now technically council doesn't have an individual that they have appointed and perhaps uh, you know given that we might have a, another look at this whole situation it may be a few weeks or perhaps months before we determine you know, our forward path in the interim i would suggest that you know uh, an individual be appointed to that role and then we're meeting the uh, requirements of the alberta Ma emergency management act and we can advise the uh, local aema office who actually called one day kind of inquiring about that could could we bring that back to the december 17th meeting yes so I'm just kind of wondering which one of you saw the tracks, but didn't notice the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I sort of thought that Larry was kind of volunteering, but I wasn't sure. He is. He is. He's volatile. Yeah, absolutely. So you could bring this back as. We're going to bring it back to the January meeting. Okay. okay. So we need a motion to do that. Yes. 
I think she's changed it there. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks, Dory. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would it be easy to just name a, a new dem today yes. rather than bring a report back and then we're done? Yeah. 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 Recommendable, at least. Yeah. You know, even if it lasts six weeks and then someone else is appointed. Yeah. Yeah. Because my father is evil. Yeah. 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 We don't need a bylaw. No. Oh, okay. Council resolution. Boris? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You just pointed clarification, you know, since we're on uh, camera. Uh, I would appreciate, you know, that uh, instead of calling them, call a whole thing uh, what it's spelled out to be. Because I'm sure there's a lot of them now. What the heck is that? You know, so spell it out, yeah, the whole thing from now on, on everything. Gotcha. I'd love to I can see. Red above the collar. Director of Emergency Management. <laughs> so we'll have we'll have a, we have a motion on the board to bring back to the January meeting. Is there any further discussion on that one? Seeing that, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Those opposed? Carry. Okay. So, Steve. Thank you. I would move that council appoint Larry Randall as the director of Emergency Management. So do you want that as temporary or Larry? Oh, here we can. Just appoint him. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. We can reappoint somebody and remove him after if we need to. Any further discussion on that? Are you okay with that? Is that okay, Larry? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I'm like I say uh, oh, do I got three Tracy, are you? Okay, seeing as there's no question on that, I'll call it. Question. Those in favor? Those opposed? Carry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Who's moving lunch? Lunch. All in favor? Carry. Okay.